Right, so our task now is to prove the mostovsky shepherdson collapsing lemma, which I outlined last time. So let's remind ourselves of what that is saying. This is lemma 228 in the notes. <clears throat> it's saying, we suppose that we have a set H and we have a relation which is sort of looks a little bit like epsilon. It's well-founded and it's extensional. And recall what extensional meant. We had that a relation was extensional, in the previous definition. It was extensional on some collection of sets T. If you took any two sets from T, if they were different, there was some witness to their being different. Some Z was R below U, but not R below V, or the other way around. Which is just what it would mean for sets to be this is just what it means for epsilon to be extensional, right? If there are only two sets that are different, there's some epsilon member that witnesses their difference. So these are the prerequisites for this lemma to work, is I may have H here, and I've got this relation R. And what we're going to see is that HR is isomorphic to a transitive collection of sets. And in fact, it's, it's unique, this M, given the H and R, and the isomorphism is also unique. And we'll see that as the proof goes, the proof defines or shows us what this pi actually has to be. And the second part of the proof, which we'll come back to, says that if H already has a transitive set, which is a chunk of it, on, on which the relation R happens to be epsilon. So in that special case, then the pi is actually identity here. So let's see how this, this proof goes then. <clears throat> so again, I will follow closely the notes that are here. So proof, so this is all about part one here. So we first show that if there is such an M with an isomorphism, then the isomorphism pi is unique. So if such a pi to something exists, then it is unique. So this is clause one. The proof proceeds by going through six clauses, rather. So we'll proof, proof of one here. OK, so we suppose we've got a pi, pi and m are, are given. So take two things in H. And we'll see what pi has to be. Now, if U is R below V, then as pi is an isomorphism, it's order preserving, we must have that pi of U is a member of pi of V. So remember, it's disappeared off the page, but what we're doing is taking HR isomorphically to some M epsilon. So the R relation becomes the epsilon relation. So it's a bijection and preserves, takes R over to epsilon. So URV becomes pi of U is epsilon pi V. because pi preserves order relations. So 
So what is that saying for V in H? All of the pi of U's where U is in V are going to be in pi of V. So take any V in H. Right, that the collection of pi of U's for U R V, just in the description we've in the situation we've just described, all of these are in pi of V. So this must happen if pi is to be an isomorphism like this. And we'll just reverse this inclusion and then we'll see exactly then what pi of V must be. So we'll take some Z in pi of V. Is something arbitrary that's in there. So Z is in M. Because M is transitive, so any element of M is actually a subset of M. So Z is in M. So M is just the range of pi. So this Z is pi of something. So Z is pi of U for some U or other in H. Here. So what is that saying? I took something, an arbitrary thing in pi of V, right? and I found that it was <coughs> pi of u for some u in h. So that is saying anything in pi of v, such as this z here, is an element of this set over here, the collection of pi of u's for u in h here, and u is r below v. Right, because if Z here is pi of U, right, and Z is in pi of V, this would mean then that U is R below V here. So all these typical Zs that are in here, they're also in this, this set here. So now we've got the inclusions now going both ways here. Right? So these are now the same thing. Thus, if pi exists, it must have this form. There's no other option for it. Pi of V must equal the collection of pi of U's here, where U becomes below, U comes before H. Right. So if the isomorphism exists, and it's still an if at this point, if it exists, it must have this form that pi of v is the collection of pi of u's for u and h and u r v. So, um, so pi must be unique. So i.e. pi is unique. And that would finish one here. <clears throat> so two is the assertion that actually pi does exist. So what we do is define by by a sort of recursion, right? What pi is. So 
So we define by R recursion. <clears throat> what pi is. And you can see we just define it using what we just showed above here. We say pi of v is to be the collection of pi of u's where u is in h and comes below v in the ordering. So if I'm thinking of my ordering going up the page here, so r is coming up the page here, here's u, and I've got u is r below v, right? I'm going to have that pi of v is going to have this pi of u as an epsilon element. Sorry. So the r relation goes over to the epsilon relation. This is an epsilon on its side <laughs> over here. So of course v may have many of other things down here, and so pi of v may have other gadgets below it. <clears throat> And because R is well-founded, I can write down this as a recursive equation. This works because, because we assumed R is well-founded. Right, so I'm defining pi in terms of things earlier in the relation, assuming I've already got those defined. So it's a legitimate recursion, is what we're saying here. So pi exists, and by one, it's unique. So in particular, that means the range of pi is unique, which is m. The rest of the proof is showing that pi is what we want it to be, right? So we're at the situation here where we've defined pi, it's unique, so, and this is the range of pi, so that's unique, and we just want to check now that this is an isomorphism that I defined in this way. So we have m is the range of pi. And the other thing to note is that m is transitive. Note also here that m is transitive. But this is simply the fact that um, this is simply appealing to what I've called star in the notes, which is this recursive equation here. Right? Here's a typical element of M, pi of V. All the epsilon elements of pi of V are also the form pi of something. Right? So they're also in M. So this is kind of trivial that M is transitive. M is defined to be the collection of things in the range of pi. And over here, pi of V only has things in the range of pi in it. So it's clearly transitive. So trivially, by star. Yeah. Um, and somehow, actually, the trickiest thing is perhaps the fact that pi is one to one. We want to show it's an isomorphism. So we want it to be one to one and on to. So pi is one to one. So let me move this up here.
um, three. Phi is one to one. Okay, so it's a proof by contradiction, if you like. Suppose not for a contradiction. So that's going to mean that two different things in H get sent to the same thing under pi. So what we do is we pick some t in M, which is epsilon minimal. For the property of having two different things in H get sent to t. So having two distinct elements, let's say uh, U and V in H with pi of U being pi of V being T. So this is showing that pi is not one to one, it's sending these two distinct things to the same place, and the t is the place they're going to. So if here, if I'm looking of here on m, and here is h, <clears throat> right? so here is some t, and what we have over here in h is some u and some v, which are different, and they're both sent to t. And the assumption is that T is epsilon minimal with this property. You can say that because epsilon is a well-founded relation. Right? So any non-empty collection of sets, there will be an epsilon minimal element in there. And the contra proof by contradiction will show actually that there is an S that's below T here, epsilon below T. and some other things that get sent to S. And there is some other X here and some W, such that under pi they get sent to here. And that contradicts the defining property of T. T is supposed to have no members where two elements get sent to that member under pi. <clears throat> So if we can instantiate this diagram, it's a contradiction. And we establish that pi is one to one. Okay. So let's suppose we are in this situation. We have T and we have U and V. Now we haven't used the property that R is extensional yet. So this is where it comes in. U and V are assumed to be distinct. And R is extensional. There is something in H which kind of R distinguishes them. There is some W in H with W below U if and only if W is not below V. Right, so So just for the sake of argument, we suppose W is below U, but not below V. 
So without loss of generality, we assume W is below U, but it's not below V, rather than the other way around, which would make no, no difference for the argument. Okay, pi is an isomorphism. So pi of W is a member of pi of U over here. Right, U is being sent to T, pi of U is T, and this is pi of V in our diagram. So I've got that pi of W is a member of pi of V. So this is pi of V. It's a collection of pi of things which come from below V. So this thing here, which is epsilon below pi of V, this thing, whatever this is, it's going to be pi of something that comes, that something comes below V. So there must be some X that's below V with pi of X being this thing that's in V, pi of W. You see, pi of W is below pi of V, right? But at this point, we don't necessarily know that it comes from something that's below V, because W is below U and not V. But I know that everything that's epsilon in pi of V, right, is pi of something for something that's R below V, which is what I've written here. There is some X where pi of X is this, this gadget here. Right, so, and this is why it says in the notes, as pi of V is the set of all such pi of X's. Okay, so what we're going to do, our S over here is going to be this pi of X. set S to be this pi of X. Right. Then S is a member of T, right? Because I've got pi of X is this pi of W, which is in T. So S is a member of T here. Now I'm just writing out what we've got. Pi of x is pi of w here equals this um, s. And now I know that w is not below v. This was one of my assumptions over here. w is not below v. But x is below v. So I know that w is not x. So W is not X. So what have I got? I've got an X and I've got a W and they're both sent to the same place, which is epsilon below T. So I've instantiated this diagram here. So that gives me my contradiction. And that finishes three. 
So a surprisingly tricky bit of the proof there. And pi is on two. Well, this is trivial because M is defined to be the range of pi, so there's nothing to do. So there's nothing to say there. So I, that with three says pi is a bijection. And we lastly remark that it's order preserving. So five says it's an order preserving isomorphism. Here. Yeah. So we already have it's a bijection. Right, and that was just four and three. So this is really the definition at star. And U is R below V here. Then pi of U is below pi of V. So I'm just going back to this definition of pi here. Pi of U is the pi of, collection of pi of U's for U below V. So pi preserves this order relation here. So there wasn't much to say there also either. So that finishes part one there of the lemma. So, and that's really the substantial part. And we have part two. Let's remind ourselves what part two is here. Part two says, if additionally, I've got a, so here might be my H. Here, here's H. So it might be in a special situation that I've got some part of HX here where X is transitive. And the relation R on H, just considered on this bit, is epsilon. No, no mind what goes on up here in the froth. Right? So the lemma is going to say that, okay, I apply part one and I get some kind of collapse onto some M here by pi. But this bit doesn't have any holes in because it's transitive and it's all contained in H. So pi actually is the identity on this bit here. Well, I should say pi restricted to X more correctly. So that's what's second, what's going to go on in the second part. So we assume now that R restricted to X squared is just epsilon restricted to X cross X. And we've got that X is transitive and X is contained in H. And the last thing then we need to show is that pi on X is the identity on X. So 
So if I take some V in X, X is transitive and X is contained in H. V is contained in X and V is contained in H. Right. Well, I said X is contained in H, right? So you can write it like that here. So what does star become for V? in X here. That's going, going back to star. Right? So for V in X, for things R below V in X, this is just epsilon. For V and X, if I just think about the V's and X now. Right? But X is transitive, so any V and X, these things are in, sorry, any V and X, all of its members are in H, so I actually don't need this specification here in this particular case. So I have the pi of V is just the pi of U's for U and V here. star yields that pi of x is just the collection of pi of v's here for v and x. So what we now get to use is just an instance of epsilon induction. So we use epsilon induction on epsilon restricted to x cross x here. So the inductive, sort of the antecedent for the induction is, suppose I have the property that for all v in x, if for all u in v, pi of u equals u, if this implies that pi of v equals v, so that is saying, if I know that for all the epsilon members of v, pi is the identity, then it's the identity on v. So if I knew this, for all v's in x, then I could deduce over here for all v and x, pi of v equals v. And that, of course, is just what we want. So the theorem on epsilon induction says if something persists upwards through the epsilon relation in this way here, I know that it's true everywhere. But indeed, this is what we what we have, right? We can now just prove this thing here by by epsilon induction. Because after all, right? If I know for well, I've got a, I've got x's here. So if we have here, right, for some some v and x, I know that pi of v is the collection of all pi of u's for u in v. 
So suppose I know already for all of the epsilons that are in V that this is the identity. Then lo and behold, this just says this is just V. Right? The set of elements of V is the set of elements of V is V. So if I know pi of U is the identity for all elements U of V, I know that pi of V is the identity. And that's just what we need as an antecedent over here. So this argument here just justifies this antecedent. Okay. So this little argument here just justifies this, this antecedent. So I know this is okay. Right? So I know that pi is the identity on X over here and six, the top then is finished. So this finishes part two, right? And the lemma. So we're done here in that case. So that's the collapsing lemma. So that will take uh, a bit of thinking about to actually work out what's going on there and what, what is happening in the proof. Actually, to aid your thinking, I'll just point you towards the following two exercises. 226. So a special case. Suppose this is a well order. Not an ordinal necessarily, but a well order. So a well-ordered relation on some set right here. Okay. Um, what happens if I apply the mostovsky shepherdson collapse lemma to this? So I'll just say the collapsing lemma. To HR. Well, to be able to do so, we need that this is well-founded and extensional. Well, I'm told it's well-ordered. So that's the well-foundedness taken care of right, in here. And the extensionality is also kind of simple because I take any two different elements in the well ordering. Right? The collection of their predecessors in the well ordering must be different because one is further up the ordering than the other. So this is certainly well founded and extensional. The question is then what does the M epsilon look like? Right? So this is well-founded and extensional. So the collapsing lemma applies. Right? So there are two things there, you know, for you to say in your answer and your model answer, right? Something, a reason why it's well-founded and extensional. But then what is M like? So you might want to think about what that star, that recursion looks like when I apply it to H. So think about our definition of pi above, in particular, that relation star. Right, so just to write it out again, that was pi of E was the collection of pi of U's where U is R below V for U in H. So think about what happens at the beginning of that 
collapse or the beginning of that well order. And exercise 230. Okay, and now it says find an H and R. Well, actually, it's an X with epsilon here. But epsilon is not extensional. Epsilon restricted to X cross X is not extensional. That's going to mean there are two different sets in X. But there's nothing in X that distinguishes between those two sets members. So clearly X is not transitive. And you might like to think about an example just using a few sets, you know, the empty set, set containing the empty set, element, set, set containing the empty set, something like that. You don't have to th think of some very elaborate, uh, very elaborate X here. It can have just a few finite, finite elements in it. Right. Is one way to go about this. Right? Okay, so apply this definition though to X and see what happens. So apply the collapsing argument. So the collapsing function pi Two x, right? I mean, again, as in star and up here. So pi of v is going to be the collection of pi of u's, where u now is a member of x, um, and u is in v. So I, sorry, I've written this the wrong way around. U is a member of v, and u is a member of x. Just keep it parallel. So consider applying this recursion to non-extensional X's where this is epsilon. What, what happens? Right? Describe what happens here. What can happen? So if you can think about, if you can think of the answers to these two, you're well on the way to understanding um, what you need to know about the collapsing, collapsing lemma there. Um, one last thing I mentioned, which we essentially is part two of the, we did a proof of this in part two of the lemma, is 228. Um, and which may not be immediately apparent. So I've got two transitive sets, A and B. And I've got an isomorphism between them. So if pi is an order isomorphism from A to B. show that pi is the identity map. Pi is just the identity map restricted to A. In particular, A equals B. So what is that saying? It's saying 
the only isomorphism of a transitive set, which is an epsilon preserving isomorphism of a transitive set, is the identity. So it's just isomorphic to itself and nothing else. If it's transitive here. And before you start thinking, oh, this is somehow peculiar, or I didn't understand much here, compare what happens if you've got ordinals. After all, alpha and beta are only special cases of transitive sets. They happen to be well ordered by epsilon. And we have this from the third year, just from about ordinals. If I've got an isomorphism of an ordinal alpha with an ordinal beta, actually alpha equals beta and the isomorphism is the identity. And this pi here restricted to alpha is just the identity restricted to alpha. So this is a kind of the linear, as it were, one dimensional version of this up here. So this is a special case of this argument here. Okay, right, that's fine for now.